Thank you very much, Ruth. Um, I feel as though I've been wired for something here. Can you hear all right? Uh, I, I don't have a strong voice, so it's a good thing we have this thing. Otherwise, I'd be shouting and I might give out before my lecture this afternoon. It's a pleasure to be back here. I was here four and a half years ago as, as the Beatle professor and uh, enjoyed that association very much, um, including the pleasure, the privilege of working with Dr. Beto uh, during that semester. Um, the talk this morning um, is, I hope, I hope to keep it sort of on the light and informal side and to uh, um, invite your questions if we have time. I, I know you're all going to start to disappear about a quarter little or ten to twelve, and, and I have a luncheon schedule too, but um, I'd be happy to answer questions if, if we can have time to do so. Uh, as you probably know, the title of the lecture is Studying Youth Gangs, War Stories and Other Observations. There really is another subtitle, and that subtitle would be a quotation from a class that I took in sociological theory many years ago at the University of Chicago, and it goes something like this. A way of seeing is also a way of not seeing. I think this is a profound statement. It's pretty simple. A way of seeing is also a way of not seeing. So what's so profound about it? You don't have to think very hard, I think, to realize that in an age of specialization in the sciences and in all other disciplines and the polarization in politics, not to mention the uh, breaking out of incivility in many forms, we need to understand the implications of the ways that we see and fail to see things. We talk past each other in so many ways because we see things differently or because we fail to see things the way others see them. Uh, you all know or have heard of the parable of the blind man and the blind men and the elephant um, where the four or five blind men are asked what do they see? And they're feeling the elephant. One says, well, it, it, the elephant must be like a tree. It is, it's, has wide, wide girth and very rough bark. Uh, and it's tall. And another one says, no, an elephant is, it's very flexible. And, and I can move it around so it must be like a big hose. Uh, and another one says, no, I... The elephant must be uh, like a huge plant because I've got something here that is big and broad and I can fold it up. And so, Well, the point is obvious, of course. They were all seeing something quite different from the same animal. Now, what does this have to do with gangs? It, doesn't, it sounds a little far-fetched, doesn't it? Well, gangs, of course, have attracted the attention of law enforcement officials, of scholars, journalists, and many others for many years. And what I want to suggest is that our images of gangs reflect these many ways of looking at gangs. These images vary so widely as to strain credibility. Think, for example, of the contrast between West Side Story and the romantic picture that it presents and the, the more recent movie Boys in the Hood to take only two artistic representations. About 20 years ago, I was flying someplace to a meeting somewhere and I picked up the magazine of the, new, of the uh, air, uh, airline uh, and was fascinated to see that the feature article announced on the front of the magazine was called The Blackboard Jungle Revisited. Some of you may remember or have heard of a movie called The Blackboard Jungle, which came on, I guess, back in the 40s, a long time ago in any case. The picture on the cover of the magazine was of an obviously worried teacher. From the perspective of uh, his, uh, his perspective of the class that was out in front of him, he was... You saw, you saw him. You didn't see the class, and uh, 
he was obviously under a considerable tension and strain. An inside picture reversed the image, or reversed the perspective, and showed what the instructor was looking at. And you saw his students out there with, uh, they looked like uh, cobras, uh, bears, lions, snakes, all sorts of things. The implication being that these were members of gangs, and that the classroom that he was supposed to be in charge of was a pretty dangerous place, as indeed many classrooms nowadays are. Now, more recently, um, Ray Hutchinson, a professor at the University of Wisconsin in Green Bay, has been studying gang graffiti uh, in Chicago, Los Angeles, and San Francisco with some fascinating results. He finds, for example, that graffiti serves to advertise gangs, to present images of gangs to the public and to other gangs, as well as to the, gang, uh, the, the individual gang that puts up its own symbols. Sometimes these graffiti symbols become the basis for competition and conflict, transforming at times ordinary garden variety street gangs into conflict-oriented gangs. Graffiti may be used, for example, to taunt other gangs, as when one gang will deface the graffiti of another, uh, even reversing the image or taunting the, uh, the, the gang that put the image up originally. Scholars' images of gangs are almost as varied as are those of others. And what I want to do in the few minutes that we have here is to explore some of the reasons why this is the case and in the process illustrate some of the problems and the pitfalls of studying youth gangs. I'll first talk about some of our research in Chicago, which was conducted many years ago. It's interesting that Lou Dioblonsky is my predecessor in this series. Uh, Lou was studying gangs at as about the same time that I was uh, back in the uh, late 50s and into the 60s, and then we returned to the field in the 70s. Uh, I'll talk about the methods of study that we used, primarily more than about the findings themselves. This afternoon I'll talk a little bit more about uh, uh, the findings, because I, I want to illustrate this notion that the way of seeing is also a way of not seeing, of seeing differently. Now, first of all, let me give you my definition of a gang, because we have to start someplace, and that's a good, good place to start. Gangs, I argue, are groups whose members meet together with some regularity over time on the basis of group-defined criteria of membership and group-defined organizational characteristics. You notice that I, I'm putting all of the onus on the group itself, not on what law enforcement says or what the schools say or even what neighborhood people say. Neighborhood people may simply view them as, uh, as, as kids hanging on the street. Or they may view them as gangs where not all gangs view themselves that way. Uh, in other words, they are non-adult sponsored, self-determining groups that demonstrates some continuity over time. That continuity over time becomes important when you want to distinguish a street gang from a group of wilders, for example. Does the term wilding mean anything to you? Uh, one of the few research pieces of research that has been done systematically on a wilding gang was done on a gang in, or a, a wilding group in Fort Worth. So it's, uh, there is, there is uh, some reason for you to think about that, I guess. Uh, now, this definition is not very precise, I recognize that, but it's meant to distinguish gangs from other groups that come together only briefly or upon a few occasions, as well as from larger collectivities uh, of young people, such as milling crowds, for example, or groups that are oriented specifically towards uh, one task, for example, selling drugs, or uh, uh, some, or, or engaging in theft and fencing activities, that sort of thing. 
Now, the problem, of course, is to determine the circumstances, the community conditions, the group processes, the economic and structural conditions of society under which groups form and under which they develop particular characteristics, uh, including the characteristics that uh, we would like to change, violent behavior and crime. Now, the basic strategy in our Chicago study was to keep a window open on what was going on on the street. We were working with a, uh, with a detached worker program uh, sponsored by the YMCA of Metropolitan Chicago. Uh, that proved not to be a, a, a problem for us because we were given complete reign. In fact, we were, we were told that we could put detached workers with any gang that we identified that we wanted to study. Um, and so that they, the detached workers proved to be extremely valuable to us, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Uh, for, uh, for example, who were the detached workers? Well, they were uh, young men. Uh, most of whom had some athletic prowess uh, because of the ethnicity and racial characteristics of the gangs that we were studying. They were either black or white. We had no Hispanic gangs under observation at that time, although Gary Swartz and another research team from the Institute for Juvenile Research in Chicago had, had uh, uh, workers or observers studying uh, Hispanic gangs at that time. We uh, used the detached workers as an entree to the field. They would introduce our own graduate student observers. They would arrange for the um, uh, gang boys to fill out paper and pencil instruments or to be interviewed or simply to be there and, and to observe uh, and to report back to us. We interviewed the detached workers each week at great length in order to find out what was going on on the street. Um, we brought the, we had them bring their gang members in for uh, systematic personality testing, for example. And therein lies some tales. I said there were going to be some war stories. Um, the, the workers were invaluable to us. Uh, they were very cooperative for the most part. There were one or two that we had a, a few problems with. They seemed to identify more with the gangs and the, and the gang members than they did with uh, the research effort. But uh, uh, that was an exception. Uh, let me give you an example of, 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 a, of a war story. When we were, we were told that it would be impossible to test systematically uh, gang members, and that they were simply too too far gone, that they, they wouldn't cooperate. Well, we found that you can do wonders if you just feed them and give them a little Pepsi Cola or something like that. And in fact, we, that's exactly what we did. We stuffed them with hot dogs and, and uh, Pepsi Cola by and large. And, and they, we got them to come in with, uh, with, with ease. But we had a problem. The psychologist that we were working with uh, had set up a number of stations for interviewing, for paper and pencil tests, for performance tests. Uh, it was all very objective and so forth. I'm sure, I'm still not sure what to make of some of it. But in any case, in order to set up these stations, um, it happened that we had to pass through a laboratory that uh, Howard Hunt, who was then chair of the Department of Psychology, had. It was a histology laboratory. If, if you know what histology is, you know it's a matter of, of examining uh, it with microscopes very small sections of tissue that you want to examine. Well, it happened that Howard was studying the effects of drugs on specific areas of the brain, and he was using cats as his, uh, as his subjects. Uh, don't ask me where he got his cats, but... Uh, as a matter of fact, that's what worried the gang boys. The, ga the gang boys found when they passed through this laboratory, there was a white-coated person standing there to guard all the equipment, and there were these jars that had these little round things in them. And the first gang boy who walked in there looked around and said, what are in those jars? And the young lady who was there said, those are cats' brains. Well, you can imagine that that might have 
created quite a stir among the gang kids. They, they weren't sure which cats were, <laughs> were going to be examined and whether they might be the next ones in the bottle. But uh, that, uh, that, that proved to be a, uh, just a minor distraction, and, and we, we got them through all right. But the, all sorts of things happened like that in the process of the research. Um, now, to illustrate my sub-subtitle, A Way of Seeing is, no, is a Way of Not Seeing. One of, the, um, one of the observer reports that came to our attention early on in the project was, it took place in a pool hall, which was the hangout of one of the groups that we were studying, a group called the Nobles on the south side. And um, this was the favorite hangout uh, our observer, it was, it was in a black area, our observer was a white graduate student. And uh, he was observing what was going on. You could see the, the boys were playing pool, everything was cool, everything was getting along fine. When the detached worker sidled up to him and said, Whitney, did you see that drug transaction going on? And Whitney said, what drug transaction? Well, he said, all right, now watch... Uh, watch uh, the one one boy who who was addicted to heroin. They, they called him Slap Daddy because of that. He said, "Watch Slap Daddy and see what happens." Well, as as happens, he he watched this young man and he he was shooting pool and uh, occasionally a, a young woman would come up and sort of tap him on the shoulder, and uh, uh, Slap Daddy would give the pool cue to somebody else and he'd saunter over to. Uh, a coat rack on the wall and if you looked at him very carefully you could see that he was placing something in the jacket in the pocket of that jacket what he was doing was delivering heroin because he knew that every time that young woman tapped him on the shoulder that there was another delivery to be made he was carrying the, the heroin on him on his person but he was delivering it in a way that he would never see who was purchasing it the young woman took care of getting the money. Now, without the sophistication of knowing what was happening there, my observer, our field observer, would never have had the foggiest notion of what was going on there. On the other hand, there are it, it cuts both ways. Whereas the, gra the graduate student couldn't see what was going on, what he could see obscured in the way he was interpreting what was going on, obscured other action that was going on. On the other hand, the detached workers who were our eyes and ears, as they came to be familiar with our research goals, began to see things and began to interpret things in ways which which were incompatible with what we wanted them to do. In other words, they would come in and instead of saying, telling, describing what went on uh, in the, on the street uh, in between their interviews, their weekly interviews, they would start talking about opportunity structures. And they'd be talking about anomi. And they'd be talking about a lot of things that scholars talk about in interpretation. We didn't want to hear about opportunity structures. We wanted to hear about things like jobs and job searches and problems that kids had in going to school and so forth and, and in working and with each other. We didn't want to hear these uh, fancy words or interpretations that scholars put on these things. And that's not a knock on scholars. It's the, it's the essence of what we do to generalize and to seek to understand uh, beyond the experiences of everyday life. So we need both types of thinking if we're going to get a handle on these sorts of problems. Um, I can see already, I'm, not, I'm only going to get halfway through this lecture. Um, well, there were many such examples. Uh, the, the workers, <laughs> they, were, they were wonderful in, the, in trying to help us. I remember one young man who stopped by the office uh, as he was leaving his weekly interview uh, another graduate assistant was doing the interviewing and he had he had told me earlier that he had found a, a gang that was using uh, drugs rather heavily and uh, we knew we were looking for a drug using gang to, to study 
he stuck his head in the door and says, don't worry, Doc, I'll keep them on the stuff until you can study them. <laughs> well, that wasn't exactly what we had in mind either, but it was, it was an, interesting, uh, an interesting experience. One other thing before I... Um, oh, there, there's so many. I, it's, uh, see, I, I haven't been in the field for a while, so it's wonderful for me to be able to recreate some of these experiences. When we first got to Chicago, we uh, went to the police department to explain what we were doing. We didn't want the police to feel as though we were interfering with their jobs. We wanted them to understand what we were trying to do. And um, the head of the juvenile division was a big Irishman who proved to be very helpful to us. Uh, and uh, in fact, he said, uh, well, sure, I can, I can give you a list of all the gangs in Chicago. Well, he pulled a list out. There was about 300 gangs listed. And uh, I said, well, you know, can I have a copy of this? Oh, sure, that's fine. We'd be glad to have you do it. Because uh, they had little notes about what these gangs, where they were located and what they were doing and so forth. Well, to make a long story short, when we got out into the field and started looking for these gangs, we found that we couldn't find a lot of them. But when we inquired, we found that, yeah, there was a gang like that. But they're, now they're a part of this other gang. Uh, or we, we would find a gang that wasn't on the list, and we might find that, yes, sure, that's a combination of the old Cobras and the, and the Imperials or something like that. In other words, the situation was changing so rapidly that the police could not keep up with that changing situation. Uh, a few years ago, um, I was in Chicago to address a, a governor's conference on youth and it was at the time that uh, the most notorious leader of the Black Peace Stone Nation was getting out of jail and uh, uh, the names may be familiar to some of you, Jeff Fort. And so I asked people from the Institute for Juvenile Research, people with the Illinois the Department of uh, Delinquency Prevention, they actually had such a, a department um, other people who'd, who were knowledgeable, who'd been around. I said, well, what's happening with Jeff Ford? Because he, isn't, he was a notorious character, still is. Uh, and nobody could give me a straight answer. There was speculation he might be doing this, he might be doing that. Nobody really knew. Now the point there then is that simply knowing the territory is not sufficient. Simply being on the scene is not sufficient to know what's going on on the street. You need, you, you need to get in and do, get, your, get your hands dirty with research. You need to get data. And uh, our statistics don't do a very good job of doing that. Uh, but field research is about the only thing that will do it. That's not to say that field researchers are always right, that they always see the real truth either. Even field researchers... Are, have their own perspectives and their own biases. So what we need are different ways of looking at things, different ways of seeing the same phenomena so that we can really understand what is going on. Now, there are just so many other things we could talk about, but I want to switch to current methods that other people are using uh, and to illustrate the, uh, some of the problems that come up. Joan Moore and her colleagues uh, follow a practice of collaborating with former gang members, uh, many of them having been contacted in prison earlier. And she has a couple of books that are very good, particularly among the Hispanic communities in Los Angeles. Uh, her student, John Hagedorn, has done excellent work in Milwaukee uh, interviewing gang, the founders of Milwaukee's gangs. And he, he has a little book called People and Folks. Uh, and he has a number of more recent articles. And he's, uh, he interviews these uh, mostly men, young men, but also some women. And then he studies the communities from which they come. And he studies the economic situation in, in uh, Milwaukee. So he combines uh, sort of a macro perspective of the economic situation uh, in general, the job availability and so forth, with a careful look at institutions in the local community, uh, 
with the perspectives of these gang members, or many of them now former gang members. Um, so he uses different methodologies, and most people do. When they use different methodologies, a variety of them, then you get a, a, a much more uh, well-rounded picture than if you use only one technique. Malcolm Klein, uh, back in the 60s, used systematic um, observation and testing of, of, his, uh, of his gang members. Lately, he's been relying upon police data uh, more than anything else. He points out, and I think it's, a, it's very important to, to uh, realize, that police intelligence regarding gangs has improved enormously over the past 30 years or so. It was very primitive when we first went into the field uh, in, uh, in late 59 and extending into the 60s and the 70s. It has become much more sophisticated. And what, uh, what Klein has done is to compare police definitions of certain crimes and to study uh, what that can tell you about differences in incidents and, and so forth. He compared the uh, definitions of gang-related homicide in Chicago and Los Angeles, for example. Finds uh, quite different uh, definitions and the statistics come out differently, but when you look at them carefully, he finds that the uh, character of gang homicides is really very similar in those two cities. Um, even more recently, Klein has been surveying police departments all over the country. Uh, getting some uh, fairly astounding results concerning the spread of gangs into even small cities. Um, and uh, some fairly astounding results concerning the street gang drug connection. And, and, and I, I'll go into this a little bit more this afternoon, but briefly what he finds is that that's a very tenuous connection. That the uh, conflating or the um, um, well, conflating is the best word. Bringing together, viewing together street gangs and drug gangs is a mistake. That if you ask police all over the country, you find very few of them find that drug gangs have much to do with street gangs as such. Now that should call for an elaborate definition of street gangs versus drug gangs, and I don't have time to do that. Suffice to say, that the ordinary garden variety street gang does not have the degree of organization or dedication to a systematic task or the skills to handle complex drug networks. You have to be organized for that, specifically for that, in order to be very successful. That's not to say that street gang members don't sell drugs. Many do. Many use them. But to say that it's the gang that's doing it, is a mistake. You, you just miss all of the important organizational characteristics that have to be present for a drug gang to be successful. Martin Sanchez Jankowski at uh, UC Berkeley has been uh, observing gangs, uh, some, he says some 37 gangs over a 10 year period in Boston, New York and Los Angeles. Many questions arise, and I know some of you have been studying with uh, Professor Triplett uh, um, that book, and I'm, I'm glad you are because it, it's a fascinating book. Um, the, the, there are many problems with it because we simply don't know uh, how, wh how long uh, Professor Sanchez Jankowski was in, in contact with his gangs, uh, how, how closely he was able to observe them what things he heard about versus the things that he actually observed. He doesn't make those distinctions. He's painting a sort of a holistic picture uh, when uh, making things look much less homogeneous, I would say, than any other gang studies have portrayed. All of the other gang studies that I'm familiar with suggest that the local community is absolutely crucial in, in determining the character of gangs, the character of youth collectivities in general. Um, you don't find that in the Sanchez Jankowski book, in spite of the fact that he spent time observing. And he's an honest scholar, I have no doubt about that. Uh, 
and he's personal, very personable. But uh, the, many questions arise as to as to how accurate some of his observations or some of the reported observations are. Jerry Skolnick, current president of the American Society of Criminology, has a similar problem in that his generalizations about gangs, particularly in California, uh, rest upon uh, interviews with convicted felons. Now, uh, convicted felons can oftentimes be very useful uh, for the information they can provide. But if you're going to ask convicted felons about drug distribution and gang organization, think for a moment what you're likely to get. You're likely to get some pretty elaborate rationalizations, justifications for one's own behavior, a portrayal of a much more skillful, well-organized operation than was actually the case on the street. Uh, gang researchers who've been on, in the field soon learn to distinguish between war stories that you're told about and what you can actually observe. And I'm not sure that uh, Skolnick has gotten a very clear picture uh, on the basis of the methods that he has employed. Contrast that with Diego Vigil's studies uh, in East Los Angeles of Hispanic gangs uh, Vigil is an anthropologist, and uh, he he grew up in an area, he knows the area, he knows the people. He, he can see what others don't see when they go into that community. And I'd be much more likely to trust his observations. Um, Felix Padilla uh, studies uh, Puerto Rican gangs in uh, Chicago. Uh, it's hard for me to interpret Padilla's work. He talks about uh, interviewing gang members and being in the field, but the picture that he presents is one of uh, community uh, gang integration that uh, very few others have observed. I'd say Sanchez, Jankowski, and Padilla come the closest to, being, uh, uh, to seeing the same thing. And I, I, need, I would need to know much more about what he has actually observed versus what the gang boys have told him in his office at Loyola University. It's one thing to, to interview in your office and another thing to be out on the street day to day and observe. Uh, I guess the, the message, if, uh, and I'm, I'm not quite ready to quit, but I want to give you one final ad ad admonition before reviewing some of these others is very simple. When you read about gangs, ask questions about the sources of information. Ask questions about the data that you have been, uh, that have been reported to you. How did those data come about? How confident can you be of the observations that are being reported? Uh, are there, is there any reason to doubt what you are reading? And I could probably give you a lot of reasons to doubt most anything, but and I don't want to destroy uh, the, the the research industry, and I'm sure I won't. But just be be aware that people see things through different perspectives. Let's review a couple of others: uh, Scott Decker in St. Louis, field observations and interviews, and interviews with uh, with parents. He's He's going a little further, and, and it's, uh, I'm, I'm glad he is. It, it's a good idea. Scott Cummings, the uh, young man who did the study of the Wilders in Fort Worth, he studied the boys who were picked up and, and later uh, um, uh, successfully charged with the Wilding incident. Now, uh, in, in a sense, it's similar to what uh, Lou Jablonski was uh, doing with the Michael Farmer incident and others uh, back in New York in the, in the 50s. Uh, he's interviewing people who have been identified as the, as the ring leaders in, uh, in, in, in particular incidents. Um, and he comes up with a different perspective and, and uh, a different, different conclusions about the Wilders, just as Yablonsky comes up with different conclusions about the violent gang that he describes as a near group uh, some 40 years ago now. 
What we need to do is to try to see why these differences in what people are reporting exist. Uh, and I obviously can't go into all of that just now, but what I'm saying is that if we could understand that, if we could understand better why it is that one person gives us this picture and another gives a, another picture, it may be that, that there's a grain of truth in both or in many different perspectives. But it may also be that we're talking past each other instead of taking advantage of the insights that we have to give to each other regarding a very complex phenomenon. Jeff Fagan uh, interviews samples of school dropouts and, uh, and of students in college or in, uh, in high schools and uh, tries to get some comparisons. Um, it's, you know, it's a defensible methodology. It's, it's not really field work in the sense that many of these other people are, but he's, he's done some nice work. Carl Taylor, uh, who interestingly enough runs a security organization in Detroit, makes observations and interviews that are conducted by himself and his employees in his security organization. He comes up with a very different picture of gangs, of gang organization and gang purposes and so forth in Detroit than anybody has portrayed anyplace else. Well, now, to what extent is that a function of Carl Taylor's peculiar orientation? Not, not peculiar, his particular orientation as a security, uh, head of a security company? Uh, it's, it's an interesting question, and so far I, I don't think anybody can really give us a final answer on that. Or think of a, a very different methodology, the Denver and Rochester, uh, Denver, Colorado, Rochester, New York, longitudinal uh, studies, uh, studying general populations in high at-risk communities. That is, they tend to be inner city, uh, less affluent, heavy minority populations because they want to, they, that's, those are the populations they, they want to uh, understand uh, more than anything else. Largely by self-reports. Um, I know a little about self-report self -report methodology because I, I did work in that area very early in my own career. Self-reports can be very useful, but you always have to be very careful about whether what is being reported really happened, uh, whether um, it may be the self-reports may be subject to um, exaggeration on the one hand or hiding something on the other hand. So in the final analysis, what, we're, what I'm saying is that when you look through the eyes of a particular person, including yourself, including the scholars, including the social workers, the police, whoever it is, whosever eyes you're looking at the phenomenon, keeping in, keep in mind that you're seeing through a particular perspective. And uh, I guess uh, the final message is ask for more information. Ask for the reconciliation of differences that uh, come up in different studies in order to try to understand really what's going on. Only if we can do that will we have a basis for uh, intelligently uh, um, applying such knowledge for prevention, for correction, uh, for law enforcement uh, activities. Now I've used up all but about five or ten minutes at the most of the hour and I haven't given you any chance to ask questions. May I, do you have questions? that we could toss around for just a few minutes? Yes, please. You said that a lot of that observation is cultural, like when you talked about the Hispanic community or the black community, uh, someone that grew up in that ethnic culture is naturally going to see something different than, say, if you're in a black community and you had a white group, he's not going to understand. Uh, that we're all of us a product of our culture. There's no, no question about that. And I guess the... We, uh, we felt there might be some advantage uh, to having both similar and very different cultural perspectives on the same phenomena. But you're absolutely right. Uh, um, getting, uh, growing up in a particular culture is, is going to equip you for seeing things that a person who hasn't grown up in that culture um, would, uh, would see.
Other questions? Have I lulled you all to sleep? <laughs> really? Could you tell us a little bit about something we talked about a little bit this morning, but um, I thought it was interesting when we were talking about um, how God gave the spread in this morning and some thoughts that you have. Yeah. yeah. It's Huntsville. We talked a little bit about Huntsville. Right. And I guess where I think. Yeah. Uh, well, again, this, this is based largely on Mac Klein's data. And you ought to invite Mac here to talk. He'd, he'd do a good job for you. Um, what he finds is that the spread of gangs has been very rapid and very recent. That is, if you notice all those studies that I was citing, uh, and I'm not sure I identified all the cities, but they were mostly Los Angeles, Chicago, Detroit. I could have cited uh, Mercer Sullivan's fine work uh, from New York. Um, all of them are really, uh, Milwaukee is the smallest of the cities that, ha that has had any really uh, thoroughgoing investigation. They're all very large cities. Now, what Klein is finding is that people, uh, that police in um, communities 10,000 and over, uh, some of them even smaller, are, many of them are reporting the emergence of gangs. Now, Klein is, is sophisticated enough to know that you don't just take a report that, yes, we have a gang problem. You, he asks them about, well, what, what do these gangs look like? And he is convinced on the basis of the replies that he's getting it, that the gang problem has indeed spread very rapidly and very widely uh, throughout the United States. The other thing that he's become more and more convinced, however, two things. One is that most of the spreading... And most of the growth, uh, it, uh, these are homegrown gangs. They're not imported from Chicago or Los Angeles. They are homegrown. They're a product of the local situation. This does not mean that you won't find vice lords in Milwaukee and just as well as Chicago where they, they first began or that you, may, you might find uh, uh, disciples or whatever or crips or bloods people identify them, themselves in this way in other communities. Surely you will. Sometimes that's a function of families moving. Other times uh, a, a member of a gang, one of those gangs, may decide that the grass is greener someplace else and, and try to sell drugs someplace else. It's, it's an entrepreneurial thing. It doesn't mean that the Crips or the Bloods are controlling what that person is doing. Uh, so far, there's very little evidence of the sort of spread a, a, of centralized control of drug markets. This is a controversial topic, and uh, there are some police who believe that there are that there is this tight connection. Jerry Skolnick comes up with observations that he he believes that uh, the Los Angeles gangs have been successful as gangs in controlling drug traffic elsewhere. I'm very skeptical of that, and, and by and large, the, uh, the police in some of these places that uh, are reported to be controlled by Los Angeles gangs uh, don't see it that way either. They see it more as individual entrepreneurship, uh, which is an, a great American tradition. Uh, and if you, if you want to read a fascinating book along those lines, read uh, Terry Williams' little book, Cocaine Kids. A group of small group of Dominicans in in, uh, in New York City, uh, which uh, a very very small group that was highly dedicated. He said they worked long hours. It was very dangerous work. They had to develop high highly developed skills, um, and, and so forth. That was a drug gang, no question about it. And they were quite successful. At the end of about three years of observation, they were burned out. Uh, some of them have been badly wounded in, in violence. Uh, the, lead, the gang broke up. The leader left. He took his winnings and moved with his wife someplace else. Uh, that's one type of story. That's not the story of the Crips or the Bloods or the Vice Lords or whatever expanding their drug operation and controlling it into Seattle or Spokane or Fort Worth or Huntsville or wherever. Any other questions? Well, let's go ahead and, and type them. We've been working okay. pretty hard. Um, sure, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>